As you might have noticed, uh, and as also the previous sessions have indicated, the world is quite a mess. And some of you would say that a mess again, or it has been the mess all the time. But indeed, we have very many global challenges uh, and also internal challenges. Some of the global challenges were actually uh, already mentioned in the previous channel uh, uh, session, mm, like Russia and, and uh, Russia's activism in both the East and South, then also Iran question, then Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, North Korea, but in addition to, to these challenges, we also have internal challenges uh, within the Alliance and within the European Union, like Brexit. We have, uh, of course, fractions of, of uh, uh, different political fractions within the European Union, domestic problems, then trade war with the United States, and of course, migration. And all this has a very direct impact on the security of the European Union and the transatlantic alliance and also the neighborhood. Um, at the same time, we have the increasing mistrust between the allies. And some of you would say that this is a transatlantic relationship that is in crisis. So we often hear Europeans saying that Trump's dismissive treatment of Europe is beginning to erode the transatlantic alliance. So the question is whether the President of the United States remains committed to NATO, the liberal world order, and the survival of the European Union. All these factors together uh, have created a lot of political enthusiasm in Europe. For example, take uh, President Macron and his statement about strategic independence, or Angela Merkel's urging Europeans to take their fate in their own hands, or Heiko Maas, the German foreign minister's ambition to form a counterweight against the, against the US. In addition to that, there is a myriad of defense initiatives uh, connected to Europe. On the one hand, the idea of Europe taking more responsibility is hardly a bad thing, because burden sharing is only fair. On the other hand, the reality is that Europe has nowhere to go for hard security guarantees but the US. So the question is uh, whether the European rhetoric is actually serving our own interests, especially in countries bordering Russia. Um, I don't know whether I will wait for the two panelists, or I will proceed, but I think I, I will proceed, and I, I start with you, uh, General Hodges. Um, what do you think? How does this sort of political disunity within the European Union and among NATO allies plays out a military field? When, when this, I mean, real stuff comes into play, military planning and all that in, includes. Is it okay if I stand up? Because I, I can only see like the first two rows and I know that Edward Lucas is sleeping in the fourth row, for example. <laughs> so I want to stand up, make sure he stays awake. Rena, thank you. That was a, a very sobering, uh, almost depressing uh, assessment. But actually, uh, the reason I like to come to Georgia is because I always get super motivated, uh, get fired up, because I'm surrounded by people who uh, 
are willing to, to risk everything uh, and fight for their own freedom and their, and their future, which is why they're such a great partner uh, for the United States, uh, such an important co European country, and why they ought to be a member of NATO now. I don't know what the hell we're waiting for. Let me, um, let me make five quick points. Number one, uh, the Black Sea region, uh, and I think the European Union recognizes this also, uh, the Black Sea region is going to be the theater of potential conflict for the next 15 years. It's, it's emerging that this is where uh, I think Russia values the Black Sea even more than they do the Baltic Sea or the Arctic. Um, I think the Alliance has done a very good job of addressing the challenges in the Baltic um, region. Uh, our allies, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, incredible uh, countries, Poland, they're doing their part, the Alliance is doing its part, but now we have to address the Black Sea region, not in sequence of priority, but that's just where we are. And I think the Alliance recognizes that also, that came out during the summit uh, in Brussels this summer. And so this theme of coherence of NATO's deterrence I think you're going to be feeling it a lot more in the Black Sea region. Certainly the organization that I work for, CEPA, Center for European Policy Analysis, which has always placed a lot of attention on the Black Sea, is going to be on the Black Sea region, is going to be working on this um, over the next year and a half. Um, Georgia joining the alliance would immediately improve, not harm, or risk stability in the region. Why is that? Because it would be a member of the most successful alliance in the history of the world. Russia, the Russian Federation, absolutely does not want to get into a conflict with uh, the alliance. They're using everything they can operating below the level of war. And they certainly have, uh, you see what they're doing against the Ukrainian Navy in uh, Azov and also trying to squeeze uh, Mariupol. Um, their uh, illegal occupation of Crimea. All of these things are out there, but they do not want to take on the alliance, which is why it's so important that we stick together. Third point, uh, the strategic location of Georgia. Uh, nobody is ever as uh, excited as the newly uh, converted. Everybody in this place knows it, but not everybody in America appreciates or understands the, the strategic value of Georgia's location. And when you think about the uh, coming uh, expansion of east-west uh, trade. Uh, you look at uh, Georgia, where you sit right now, uh, as the portal to Europe for all of Eurasia. Um, and I hear about a, a project like the Anaklia port project, where you'll soon have a port uh, that is capable of uh, receiving every ship that can make it up the Bosphorus could come to Anaklia. Then Georgia can really begin to reach its full potential, because they're really uh, and General Chachaba is the one that explained this to me. There are three major east-west corridors. One goes through Russia, one goes through Iran, one goes through the Black Sea. Hmm. Which one do I want to use? Of course, it's the Black Sea region and Georgia sits right in that place. And that's another reason why we need Georgia in the alliance. And I think as nations become more economically dependent on each other, that improves stability. Last point I'll make is Black Sea cooperation. Until Georgia is a member, there are still so many things that we could do uh, with all of the nations around the Black Sea, uh, three NATO allies, Romania, Bulgaria, and Turkey, of course, as well as our partners, Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. Uh, intelligence sharing, start to step, build up that network of intelligence sharing. Exercises like Secretary Thompson talked about, um, air defense. I think there's a lot of things that we can do to protect important uh, facilities. And by Georgia becoming a part of this network, not just U.S.-Georgia exercises, but networks, uh, even maritime exercises, um, I think that will uh, help improve the security and stability uh, in this region until we have uh, alliance membership, which I absolutely believe is coming. It ought to be here now. Uh, I believe it's coming. And I will I look forward to questions. Thank you very much, General Hodges. And uh, we welcome more panelists. Thank you very much. And uh, Georgian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. David. Uh, Sakaliani has just uh, Sakaliani has just joined us as well as 
Mr. Tachan Ildem, Assistant Secretary General for Public Diplomacy, uh, NATO. So we just uh, started very cautiously. Without you, we sort of, I uh, painted a very gloomy picture of, of the situation in, in Transatlantic Alliance and, and in Europe in general. And I talked about all these global challenges, but also the disunity within the Union and uh, Transatlantic Alliance and the growing mistrust of, uh, of uh, allies, and especially the European big ones uh, against the US. President Macron's statement I mentioned, and also Angela Merkel's ambitions. And um, uh, Mr. Minister, I'm turning to you now. And uh, before I start this uh, conversation, I also have to mention that uh, Mr. Minister has to leave a little bit earlier, so after these opening remarks, if you have any questions to Mr. Minister, you have to ask these first. But Mr. Minister, um, taking into consideration all this disunity and political sort of uh, gambling within the alliance, how do you feel as Georgia? I mean, Georgia has been on the path of, of Europe and, uh, and NATO for a very long time, and you have been one of the most committed partners. Uh, of the Western alliances, how do you feel as somebody who looks at what is going on and knows that uh, that your membership is dependent on this gambling a lot? Well, thank you very much. It's a really honor and pleasure for me to participate in this uh, conference. Uh, usually it's a um, conference uh, with the uh, participation of our friends and colleagues and the excellent opportunity to talk about the current situation, the challenges we are facing regionally, um, and also the, um, the title of the, uh, this year's conference, The World Upside Down, demonstrates the uh, situation that the, uh, we are facing right now. Uh, of course, uh, the, uh, the main foreign policy priority for Georgia is uh, full integration into European and Euro-Atlantic structures. The, this policy is uh, the main principle of the uh, program uh, recently um, presented by the Prime Minister in the Parliament during the approval of the new Georgian government. Uh, this uh, priority is uh, reflected in the main document of Georgia, the Constitution of Georgia, as well as in numerous resolutions of the Parliament. Um, and Georgia demonstrates significant progress on its way towards the full integration into the European family of nations as well as NATO. Uh, in 2014, we have signed an association agreement together with a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. Um, also, uh, two years ago, Georgia was granted visa uh, free regime with the European Union, which was an important achievement for, on our way towards the European integration. And we have a very ambitious agenda to go beyond the already signed agreements, the association agreement and the association agenda, because uh, the uh, goal, which it's re really important for the government to have uh, um, ultimate goal. And this ultimate goal is the full integration into European Union. And this goal helps us to consolidate society. This goal helps us to consolidate the uh, the entire political spectrum, and it's, uh, it's obvious that uh, there are many differences between the ruling government party and the opposition on internal development, but there is unity, there is a lot of common on foreign policy priorities with regard of security challenges we are facing, and um, uh, definitely having a, a new goal which will unite Georgia for the whole political spectrum, the whole civil society is really very important. Um, uh, that's why uh, I would like to also use this opportunity um, uh, having the presence of our European partners to talk about the possibility for Georgia to have this uh, uh, European aspiration, which uh, is uh, the, 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 the ultimate goal towards the uh, final membership. Um, uh, we realize that uh, for the time being maybe there is no consensus, political consensus on this issue, but uh, it does not uh, uh, discourage us for, to continue our vigorous efforts towards the integrational processes. That's why we are currently working on the 
um, uh, roadmap concept, road, it's a ro roadmap to Europe, which is a concept paper, uh, and uh, which uh, is already approved by the government, and uh, we are now, now wait, working on the modalities and the um, uh, institutional modalities as well as the implementation steps uh, on this uh, roadmap, which enshrines the more sectoral integration with the European Union, more active cooperation in different, uh, uh, through uh, different uh, uh, programs and agencies, more physical integration, as well as um, uh, cooperation and talks in different formats. Last year we have initiated the format of security dialogue with the European Union and the recently the, from the European Union, from the presidency, it was declared that the uh, European Union is introducing the uh, the new format, which is unprecedented for the format. No other Eastern Partnership members have the similar format. It is the government to government, the co college, we call it co college meetings between the government of Georgia and the uh, European Union Presidency and the uh, Commission. Um, uh, and um, in the uh, coming months, in November, we'll have the first meeting of the college meeting where we, together with the prime minister at the level of prime minister and the line ministries, which are directly engaged in the process of European integration, will talk about the current situation, about more sectoral cooperation and more, polit uh, and more issues related to the uh, participation of Georgia in different programs and agencies. Uh, so it's, it's really very important to prepare Georgia factionally towards uh, the final integration into the European Union. Uh, uh, the visa liberalization, which was an important achievement uh, on its way, it was not only a technical decision, it was an important political message which brings Georgia closer to the European Union. Another direction of uh, our mm, uh, foreign policy priority and uh, as uh, today's panels, um, the main direction is uh, uh, the NATO uh, is also the, the important direction of our foreign policy activities. Uh, and here again, we are demonstrating significant progress. Um, uh, the recent NATO summit uh, was an important uh, um, event and the expectation was very high here in Georgia toward this summit and uh, we had uh, three main goals first to participate at the highest possible level at the uh, summit level uh, uh, the, to discuss the issues related to the no uh, georgia nato integration process and this goal was achieved and we had unprecedented summit level meeting at the heads of states and government level where together with ukraine we have talked about the uh, integration of nato integration processes uh, in georgia and it's really important that uh, the, uh, the main focus of this meeting was uh, in the regional context, regional security context, uh, together with uh, Ukraine. Um, as a result of this meeting, uh, the important declaration was adopted, and this declaration is a consensus-based de declaration, and it's the uh, first time in the history of Georgia NATO integration we have s such kind of uh, um, a political declaration at the level of uh, heads of states and governments. This is a very substantive document with a three-page document which reflects the all main directions of Georgia and NATO integration. Uh, it also reflects uh, all reforms conducted in the military field as well in political and democratic dimension. And also the, uh, some practical aspects were also reflected in this document, especially with regard of cooperation in the Black Sea security. Um, prior to the summit, we have uh, started discussion with our partners on the NATO, uh, on the uh, practical dimension of the Black Sea security cooperation. And there are four or five directions which are already reflected in the in this document. And we believe that it's time to start working on the implementation of this process. And uh, what is important, uh, this declaration once again reiterates um, uh, Bukharest summit co commitments with regard of Georgia becoming a NATO member. It also reiterates that Georgia has all practical aspects, all practical tools for eventual membership, uh, substantial NATO Georgia package, NGC, AMP, as well as enhanced opportunity partnership. Of course, there is also again mentioning of membership action plan, but it's 
um, the, the consensus among all uh, NATO allies that it, this is a political barrier and we have to do all our efforts to, in order to eliminate this uh, barrier. Um, uh, and we have to continue our cooperation with our partners bilaterally to uh, work on increased defense and security in order to increase resilience. And um, here in, in this direction we have uh, already developed very active cooperation with main strategic partner with United States on defense and security. Um, the decision to grant, uh, to, uh, grant Georgia Javelin uh, anti-tank uh, uh, system was an important decision which strengthens Georgia's defense capabilities and resilience. We have excellent program, uh, Georgia readiness program, uh, which is already uh, in the process of implementation. And uh, now we're going to continue working with our main strategic partner within the U.S. Strategic Partnership Charter meetings, especially in this direction, but not only with the United States, but other partners as well as with our European allies, uh, with NATO, with uh, France and Germany in particular. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, actually, I'm going to uh, continue with you, Mr. Ildam, and I um, would like to make a little follow-up. Uh, Georgia and Ukraine are indeed very important for European security, for the whole transatlantic security. Um, of NATO alliance as NATO is, in a way, still an intellectual construct. But if you don't have the political unity in order to implement, then it is very difficult to promise anything or, or to be reliable as an organization. And then we come to the question whether, whether there is a role for international organizations uh, anymore or whether solidarity matters. So uh, with this in the background, I would like uh, you to comment a little bit uh, of the situation of, of Georgia and Ukraine, but also uh, in the light of, of the um, I mean, Brussels summit and, uh, and all these, uh, I mean, communique and the promises that were made, how easy is it to implement? Well, first of, first of all, well, first of all, first of all, uh, please, I am to be interviewed. point of reference in our discussions and I uh, pay a special tribute to late uh, uh, Senator McCain uh, for uh, his uh, visionary work and I'm sure that this work will continue uh, with the efforts of my good friend uh, Ambassador Walker and uh, McCain Institute. Uh, well, a couple of words on NATO summit meeting and uh, unity among allies. Uh, I disagree with you that uh, we have an issue of unity, solidarity, cohesion among allies. Uh, in fact, when you look at the deliverables of NATO summit meeting, you will see 100 decisions. Uh, you will see a number of uh, statements and declarations, all enumerating in which areas NATO allies are even more stronger than ever in addressing the existing challenges in a very complex security environment. Uh, Brussels summit meeting stood as a solid manifestation of unity among allies. And one should not uh, make a mistake to see allies discussing difficult topics and as if it is an indication of uh, not having this. Historically, we always had 
among allies difficult discussions when you look at Suez Canal crisis. So it is not the first time that leaders uh, in, at Brussels summit had a serious conversation on defense spending and burden sharing. But they have a clear uh, agreement and understanding that they stick to the 2014 Wales Summit Pledge uh, to uh, have 2% uh, of their GDPs allocated for defense spending. Uh, the target to be uh, uh, realized, uh, materialized by 2024. And now allies are doing their best uh, to move ahead with national plans, sharing ideas how they will meet this requirement. We are not talking about pure allocation of uh, funds, but also in addition to cash, we are talking about contributions and capabilities. Uh, therefore, uh, I can assure the audience that uh, NATO allies are united and in solidarity among themselves in addressing the existing challenges. When it comes to uh, important partners like uh, Georgia and Ukraine, again, as the minister rightly mentioned, uh, the summit meeting provided a very good opportunity uh, to have uh, a meeting of allies with uh, Georgia and Ukraine to discuss the regional challenges. And when we talk about regional challenges, it is Black Sea security. Georgia is one very important partner, making immense contributions, not only for our strategic situational awareness regarding the challenges in the region, but also uh, with the capabilities. And NATO uh, and Georgia are both uh, determined uh, to uh, make sure that we have more, more presence in the Black Sea. Uh, there will be more uh, port calls, exercises, uh, but uh, it is for sure one area of cooperation. We are very happy to see Georgia making contributions to the operations and missions of NATO, taking part at, at, at NATO Response Force as a very important contributor. But uh, above all, we have uh, a functioning political dialogue. Only last week, on the 5th of September, we had uh, a NATO-Georgia Commission meeting with the participation of uh, State Secretary for Reconciliation and Deputy Foreign Minister. And uh, the mood in the conference hall, the meeting room, was so positive. Uh, and I think all these uh, engagements uh, with Georgia shows that they are, Georgia is on uh, the right track. We uh, are encouraged by the pace of the reforms and the commitment of the Georgian government to continue with the reform process. Uh, it is definitely good for the people of Georgia, but also for the Euro-Atlantic and European integration process. Uh, the joint statement, I again uh, agree with uh, the minister uh, that uh, it was a very solid consolidation of all what we have done so far with a future-oriented vision, uh, our uh, partnership with Georgia and definitely uh, membership is there, uh, reaffirming 2008 uh, Bucharest summit decision. Uh, and we are confident that as we have made quite a long way, we will together work uh, on these parameters to achieve the, this objective. And few words since the uh, topic of discussion is on uh, NATO, EU, and cooperation between the two organizations. 
uh, I can agree with you that there is a degree of criticism, skepticism regarding the value added of multilateralism and the international organizations and their value added. Nevertheless, uh, we should not uh, give up uh, our uh, uh, belief in multilateralism because uh, individually countries can cope to a certain extent uh, with the challenges, threats. But if we are strong, it is because we are united uh, in different formats. And uh, not any organization could be able to uh, address the challenges that I talk about alone. And it requires uh, a degree of cooperation. In 2016 Warsaw Summit meeting, uh, NATO Secretary General, together with the presidents of uh, European Commission and European Council, uh, reached uh, uh, a joint statement. And uh, in Brussels, at Brussels summit, uh, just one day before that, on the 10th of July, uh, they, they, they agreed on yet another new uh, joint uh, declaration, uh, stepping up our cooperation uh, in, a, in key areas, from uh, hybrid uh, to cyber, countering terrorism, maritime uh, security, and also enhancing the uh, capacities of our uh, neighbors. Because we know that uh, if our neighbors are uh, s stable, we are stronger and more secure. And, uh, we will be uh, working even closer with the European Union as NATO uh, in making sure that we not only have stronger capacities as allies and members of the European Union, but also strengthen the resilience of our partners. Uh, I also wish to emphasize that uh, NATO will remain to be the cornerstone of European and Euro-Atlantic uh, defense. Uh, and uh, transparency is essential, inclusivity, and uh, we all know that with the scarce resources we have, there shouldn't be two sets of requirements. Uh, and whatever new capacities, capabilities that EU can produce uh, through PESCO uh, or uh, European Defense Fund should also be available to NATO if needed. Another important thing would be that talking about transparency and inclusivity, uh, we have to recognize the importance of the contributions of uh, non-EU NATO allies uh, to the security and defense of uh, Europe and their uh, full involvement would be essential if we uh, want to create a solid uh, security and defense for Europe. And uh, certainly the efforts of the European Union will make a good contribution uh, to, in a positive way uh, to the discussions that we are having on uh, defense spending and burden sharing. Thank you very much. Hello. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, contribution. And I'm very happy to hear that I've been wrong all the way about the unity. Uh, at least within the corridors of NATO, there is a unity, and uh, all this disunity and different opinions remain in the realm of public debate, uh, which is very healthy. But before I turn to my uh, Baltic neighbor, uh, I will give some word to General Rogers, because you were nodding uh, when, I talk, when we talked about unity. And, and I would like to ask you about uh, the US and US's role in NATO. Because now, when, when I started off, I, I said that there is this sort of growing mistrust and uh, the changing role of the US within this transatlantic security architecture as such. And uh, 
my question is, uh, and we were talking about this different uh, threat perceptions and, and different uh, sort of um, security guarantees that, for example, the Baltic states cannot afford really criticizing President Trump for, for tweets or, or things like this, while Germany and France maybe can do it more freely. But what is your take on this? So if you don't mind, I'll stand again. Uh, first of all, nobody in this room or in Russian Federation should ever doubt the commitment of the United States uh, to our allies and to our partners. Um, it does not help when the president says what he does. Uh, never in my life did I ever imagine an American president would question or bring into question, hmm, I don't know, Montenegro. I mean, never did I imagine that. So it's not helpful when he, when he says that. But I'd ask to put it in context. First of all, everything that was promised at the Warsaw Summit, and I agree with uh, uh, Assistant Secretary General Ildum, um, what the alliance, how we have continued to adapt and progress, everything that was promised by the Obama administration in Warsaw, an historic summit, maybe one of the most important summits we've ever had, the Trump administration has delivered rotational forces, all the equipment for an armored division going back into Europe, having to undo decisions that were made, probably the right decisions several years ago, um, and maybe even more important, the, the support of the United States Congress. Traditionally, the Congress has been leery, or not real, has been reluctant about spending money and putting troops in Europe because there, there's no congressman or senator that represents the Republic of Georgia or Bavaria or Stuttgart. And so there was no uh, political motivation to do it. Now you had 98 members of the United States Senate before the summit voted for a resolution affirming America's commitment to the alliance and to Article 5. You never get 98 senators to agree on anything. So to get 98, uh, how powerful uh, a statement that was. And, and then of course they've followed resolutions with money and the European Deterrence Initiative, the amount of money that is provided specifically for deterrence in Europe has increased by billions, that's B's, um, three years in a row. And this coming year, it's the biggest ever. So uh, I would ask that you uh, uh, think about the United States the way that you always have. 300 million people, very diverse. Um, it's difficult political discussions right now, but this is not new. I mean, before the American Civil War, you had members of Congress shooting each other and beating each other with canes. At least we have, we're not doing that now. Um, this, this is a, it's a part of who we are and where we are. And of course, we have a very important midterm election here on 6 November. And um, I think this will, we'll learn more about where we are. But what's not in question uh, is America's commitment uh, to our allies. Um, I think it's fair, every president, I mean, President Obama, with a 98% approval rating in Germany, called them free riders. So uh, this is not new that a president would ex tell allies, you need to do more. What I would rather the alliance does is not focus on 2% as if this is some kind of a club membership dues, but instead talk about capabilities. What do we need and have a more sophisticated approach? Right now it's impossible for any German member of the Bundestag to vote to spend more money. Politically impossible because no German uh, parliamentarian wants to be seen as responding to the American president. So let's have a more sophisticated approach, incentivize Germany, which should do more, to spend more on transportation, uh, things that the alliance really needs to improve uh, military mobility, uh, improve missile defense, for example, to protect European citizens, to protect Klaipeda, Riga, uh, Tallinn, uh, Gdansk, uh, these are things that Germans could do that are think, more politically acceptable instead of just kicking them in the ass all the time about, hey, you're not, you're not paid up on your membership dues. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, General. And I'm turning not, well, last but not least to my uh, Baltic colleague, Sigmantas Pavilionis. And, um, well, you know, the Baltic states have always been the weakest link of NATO in terms of the defendability. And uh, a lot has changed 
during the past years and since 2014 a lot has changed in military terms and today we have troops on the ground and uh, there are many commitments um, but, but still um, I mean I'm, I'm just returning from Berlin when I was still asked a question whether Russia is a real threat to you and is it really going to attack you militarily? So do we really have to take this seriously? So, I mean, what do you think? Do you feel secure in Lithuania? Well, I will maybe answer in trying to summarize uh, this discussion. Well, first of all, I'm tempted to stand as we always follow American lead, but I'll try to maybe make this discussion a bit more fancy. Well, first of all, I agree with my Estonian colleague uh, that we are not united. And I think this audience, friends of late Senator McCain, is the audience where we speak truth. Uh, and we are not afraid of truth. Uh, well, uh, and uh, five things that we learned from our experience that is a successful experience of the Baltic states First of all, vision, then clarity, freedom, democracy, and unity. And I think those things, they were, you know, very uh, important for late Senator McCain. First of all, vision. Uh, if we want to get that unity back, we need to have a common vision. We lost that vision in Bucharest NATO summit 10 years ago. We've been fighting for it. We've been fighting for Georgian and Ukrainian membership in NATO, and we've been vetoed by some leaders, and this mistake is not corrected. Uh, the result of it is the occupation of Georgia and Ukraine. Let's be clear about that. So either we restore the vision and we go forward, or we are falling the victims of other visions that Mr. Putin and other KGB generals have. Well, other examples of lost vision is, for example, disunity on enlargement. We are not united on enlargement, neither EU nor in NATO. And looking to my friend David Kramer, who is always writing books about that, we are not united on Russia. Absolutely not. We have no policy on Russia, long-term policy. Russia has policy on us, and they divide us and rule us. Then second point is clarity. We have to be very clear when we speak visions and truth. You know, Lithuanians, they were very clear to Mr. Gorbachev. We said, no Soviet Union, we are independent. You know, others, they were talking different kind of politcorrect things. We said, no, freedom, please. And we have to be clear, for example, on Sarkozy plan. It is not implemented. Dear French President, Macron or whoever, you have to respect your signatures. And the West should say clearly, Russian troops didn't move to pre-war lines and international observers are not allowed to occupy territories. It's wrong. And whether Russia paid a, you know, any kind of uh, uh, cost for that, no. No sanctions introduced. I was looking to the faces of 27 EU foreign ministers in Brussels, and they said, sorry, it happens, reset please with Russia. I was not happy with this, and I'm not happy with this till today. Then freedom. You know, Georgians have to be the beacon of freedom. You know, you have just to be the best. Like Estonians, they always be the best uh, in the Baltics, and we've been always envy. Uh, so, you know, just be the best, make reforms, you know, whatever is happening, be the champion be the champion in economy, in reforms, but also be the champion in democracy. You know, de democratic countries will never defend country that is not democratic. This is kind of in our blood. But if you show that you are the beacon of democracy in the region, you, well, it touches the heart, you know, it touches the heart. You can explain it to congressmen, you can explain it to different presidents, and then you can defend the values that are your own constitutional values, that goes deep in your heart. And then unity. If we want to unite the West on Georgia, show that unity in Georgia. You know, in the next panel, it will be my competitor and, you know, Linus Linkiewicz, I'm in opposition to my foreign minister, but we like each other on foreign fronts. Left and right, you know, red and green, liberals, we've, we've been always standing together on foreign policy. 
So show it. You know, allow democracy to flourish in your presidential elections. Whoever is elected, but you know, show that you can do it together as a nation. Then build that unity in the region. Build it with Ukrainians, with Moldovans, if you want, with Baltic Black Sea tribes, as we recently been in Washington, speakers of Lithuania, Poland, Ukraine, and Georgia. We impressed the U.S. Speaker Ryan because it was the unity that we once demonstrated in Vilnius Group and in, in other different groups. But don't even think that you will be able to unite the West if you are not united in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm very glad that we are not united on the stage because now is the time to open up the discussion. And Edward was the first one. So please think of the questions. Thanks, Edward Lucas from SEPA. Um, I've got one question about the Black Sea region, which is about Turkey, um, your neighbor here in Georgia. There was a very alarming report a couple of days ago that um, Turkey was considering taking part in the Vostok um, military exercises. I don't know if it's true, but it certainly wasn't denied um, by the, this was quoting the Turkish defense minister. Um, we also see Turkey um, apparently about to buy the S-400 air defense system from the Russians, which is going to make it very difficult for other NATO countries to share sensitive uh, military technology um, with, the, with, with, with Turkey. So I've got a question about how do we, what, what do we do when we have an, a, a really important ally in this region which is going off in, in another direction. My other question is about the Baltic. Uh, we've had a Swedish election where the, um, I think, very ill-informed foreign media coverage um, you, the, got it all wrong and this sort of scare story about the Sweden Democrats winning and, uh, and coming out on top was not, that wasn't true. But there's a real chance now um, of a Swedish government which might want to join NATO. An opinion is shifting in Sweden, it's shifting in Finland. And so my question um, is if we want Georgia to join NATO because it would make the alliance stronger, doesn't the same apply to Finland and Sweden? And how should we deal with what will inevitably be a very strong Russian pushback um, if that happens? Thank you. I'm going to collect a couple of more questions before I go to the panel, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question to Minister Sal Kaliani. Referring to uh, large-scale NATO military exercises last year, Salome Zurabishvili, who is uh, uh, endorsed by Georgian Dream, the party that you represent as candidate for president of Georgia, said, quote, it is not clear to me what does appearance of American military hardware serve or what does it bring to us? How would you comment that? Thank you. Did I see a two-finger comment here in the first? Oh, no, just. OK, I will take one more and then in the next round. Hello. Um, the Turkish ambassador in Tbilisi, Ceren Yazgan. I'll reply to you later on, if you like, on bilateral basis on that. Um, now, uh, my question is regarding the um, the, this upside-down notion uh, of the security uh, to uh, actually um, to the general maybe we could start uh, you said something um, uh, about your own presidential administration's view um, so how do you think we're gonna take this again back to track all of us uh, in NATO for the partners uh, it is already known for a fact that things are upside down when we compare to what happened to 1990s and what were our expectations were. So what do you think the way ahead should be now to take things back on track to a more predictable uh, security environment uh, and in NATO and around NATO with other uh, partners for cooperation. Georgia is not the only one in this region in the South Caucasus. 
and, and definitely things are getting uh, weirder in, in, in Europe. So that would be my question, first to the general, from a military point of view maybe. Um, we had this one awkward moment when the US government have declared the sanctions, assets freezing of our Minister of Justice and Interior as the UCOM was in the room meeting with our Chief of Staff. So things are really getting uh, upside down. How do we put this back? Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm first going to give word to Minister. Thank you, people. Before I answer the question, I would like to echo what uh, our colleague from Latvia said. Uh, Thank you very much, for, first of all, for your continued support of Georgia, for your um, uh, from Lithuania support. <laughs> Unity is really very much important uh, among all EU and the NATO member states. The only power who is partners in all our discussions we are asking we are pushing for more NATO presence in Georgia more NATO exercises in Georgia the recent exercises conducted in Georgia noble partnership agile spirit the increase with increased participation of our NATO allies demonstrates the uh, the very strong ties between Georgia and the NATO and this is also reflected in the recent communique of the NATO summit we, where we are talking about the more military exercises in the Black Sea region and what was said by the Assistant Secretary about the more frequent uh, port calls and more exchange of information on the Black Sea uh, with our NATO uh, command uh, and the Georgian uh, uh, and Georgian side is really appreciated we're going to continue to uh, very actively uh, engage in this discussion on more NATO presence in Georgia and more NATO military exercises in Georgia. Thank you. And uh, let us thank uh, Mr. Minister who has to leave. So let's give him a big applause. And uh, let's return to the panel. Please, you are free to comment and answer the questions posed. Maybe not. Maybe, oh, sorry. Uh, maybe just not replying to every comment, but just a thought that I was uh, thinking to, that might be useful to build that unity. Well, you know, I really like this group of people. They, most of them are my old friends. But uh, it's nice to speak with a converted. Uh, uh, but I really like this group so much that I would love to travel with you to some other capitals, you know, to Berlin, to Paris, to Washington, because we really need heart, uh, because this unity will not, you know, is, is not for granted. We have to make it. When we wanted to be EU and NATO members, it take, took maybe 10 years of hard work, of diplomacy, journalists, you know, analysts, building the coalition for the unity for Georgia. So uh, I would love to see this conference 
key people traveling together to key capitals and lobby, lobby the West to get that unity back. Um, Mr. Ildem, oh. would you like to go first on the Turkey question? So, Turkey, uh, essential for the alliance, uh, essential um, for stability and security in the region. Uh, the alliance is so much better with Turkey than without Turkey. And Turkey is so much better in the alliance than outside the alliance. So I think it, it is vital, I, I choose the word vital on purpose, uh, that we do everything we can to make sure that we don't create irreparable damage. Now, there's been a lot of hand-wringing up here today and, oh my God, it, you know, everything's upside down and uh, unpredictable, we don't know what to do. France left the alliance. I mean, there's a reason that shape is in Mons because the French pulled out of the military structure of the alliance. So this alliance, 70 years old next year, Turkey and Greece basically went to war with each other. I mean, uh, Germany, uh, pretty tough on the United States in a lot of different, this is not new. So I think uh, what's important is the things that do unify us is not unanimous agreement on every single issue. That's, that hadn't been the case since 1949. What does unify us is the fact that our great alliance continues to adapt to meet all the challenges that, it's, that change around us so that we can assure collective security for all of our members. That's, that's what's predictable. You can, you can go to the bank on that. The United States has spent billions of dollars, even though there's not one congressman or senator that represents any town in Europe. We're spending billions of dollars because in, it is in our interest. When the president said those 30,000 American soldiers are there defending Germany, he's completely wrong. They're not there to defend Germany. That's part of America's contribution to collective security in Europe, which is vital for us because our economic prosperity is directly tied to stability and security in Europe. The economic relationship between the EU and North America is five times more than it is anywhere else. So if Germans, French, uh, Norwegians, uh, Lithuanians didn't spend one euro on defense, that would not change the strategic uh, importance of stability and security in Europe for the United States. So that's why I am so confident that this is going to continue. I wish that Sweden and Finland would join NATO. Um, but those are just, the, the alliance has a great process for uh, expansion. Uh, those nations um, obviously get to choose. This is not the 18th century where three or four capitals decide what happens for everybody else. Um, Sweden and Finland are both two great countries. They know where they live. Uh, they are essential to security in the Baltic Sea. And I think Sweden uh, in particular has done an awful lot. That when we were on exercises together, we deployed together. Um, I'm very confident that if there ever was a, a serious crisis in the Baltic region, we could count on Sweden and Finland. What would the Russian reaction be? It would be exactly what it's been for 500 years, respect. The Russians only respect strength. They despise weakness. And if we look weak and if we start letting them make decisions for us, then they will continue to occupy countries and never leave. I think um, the, I, want, I just want to go back to Turkey again. Uh, it's essential for the United States. Enterlik Air Base there, it's a Turkish air base uh, that allows the United States um, to uh, operate there. We could not do operations uh, in Syria or in the Middle East without Turkey allowing us to fly in and out of Enterlik. Russia, their base that they have in uh, Tartus has air defense systems now that range Enterlik. So Turkish and American aircraft flying in and out of, of uh, Enterlik are now inside the effective range of Russian air defense systems. That's not an accident, like they, like they didn't know how to read a map. Uh, Russia has expanded their ability to deny access, not just Kaliningrad, not just Crimea, but now into uh, Tarsus. And I think that President Erdogan is probably reconsidering his friend, uh, the President of the Russian Federation. I mean, they all went to uh, this summit now with Iran, Russia, and Turkey uh, to try and hold off this impending uh, offensive in, in uh, Idlib 
in northwestern Syria because President Erdogan knows in addition to the more than three million refugees that Turkey has already taken care of, and I remember when Turkey said 40,000 was the max that they could handle, now almost three and a half million, they're looking at another million refugees pouring into Turkey if Syrian government goes ahead with this offensive and starts killing more of their own people. President Putin chose not the guy that's going to buy the S-400, which I think is a terrible mistake to buy the S-400, but that's a different argument. He sided with the regime that uses chemical weapons against their own people. He told President Erdogan, said, no, we're not going to hold off. Syria needs to stamp out um, the last of the rebels. So I think he, he telegraphed pretty clearly where he is. He supports the guy who uses chemical weapons on his own people, not with our ally, Turkey. Well, if I may uh, go back to unity among allies, because it's important uh, to leave with uh, any wrong impression. Uh, I uh, took note of uh, the distinguished member of parliament's views. Uh, of course, one could expect uh, the others uh, among the allies to uh, adopt, assume the view express why one individual, a group of allies. But it doesn't work that way. The beauty of the work of NATO is that it brings together 29 and soon 30 to be democratic nations uh, sharing the same values. And the uh, democratic debate is in the core of our business. And we reach, to, we reach consensus decisions, and sometimes it may be perceived as a lowest common denominator for some, but again, with all the difficulties, we could be able to uh, manage our agenda properly. I fully agree with the previous speakers that uh, Warsaw summit meeting was a turning point in the recent history of NATO. Uh, we are strengthening the defense and deterrence of the alliance with additional capabilities. We are projecting stability beyond our borders. Therefore, uh, this is the right way to uh, tackle the challenges of our time. Now, uh, a few words uh, on Turkey, although I'm representing NATO here, so my national affiliation should not count. But I can at least have the liberty of borrowing the words of the Secretary General Stoltenberg, because uh, regarding S-400 purchase, he stated that it is the sovereign right, sovereign choice of each allied nation to buy any system. Uh, what NATO uh, is interested is whether the systems purchase would be interoperable with the systems that we have uh, for the air and missile defense uh, system of NATO. Uh, regarding the Vostok uh, exercise, of course, uh, the distinguished Turkish ambassador is here, so I cannot speak on behalf of the Turkish authorities. But what I understood from press reports was uh, the Minister of Defense referring to the invitation that all allies received uh, for uh, military attaches to observe uh, the uh, segment, a segment of this exercise. I don't think that uh, he was talking about sending troops to participate in Vostok exercise, which is not possible in a few days' time uh, to uh, send such troops, and I don't think that uh, it is in any way uh, in, in the minds of uh, the Turkish side, and it is not part of the discussion within NATO. Uh, one uh, last uh, thing is, uh, of course, uh, when we uh, talk about uh, uh, projecting stability, uh, it is to engage uh, in uh, the, the right political 
uh, dialogue and practical cooperation with our partners. Uh, we are uh, extremely happy that uh, during the summit meeting, a number of decisions have been taken, not only uh, related to counterterrorism for the launching of NATO mission in Iraq, it's, it will be a training uh, mission, but also uh, to uh, strengthen the uh, capacity of our partners like Jordan and Tunisia. And when we talk about uh, enhanced opportunity partners, and Georgia is uh, in this group of partners, uh, there are a number of uh, projects uh, uh, underway to strengthen the resilience of our partners, which we uh, attach great importance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will take the very last round of questions. Please keep your questions very short, and then I come back to the final uh, statements, remarks uh, of the panelists. So we had a question here in the front. Hi, I'm April Foley. I am the chair of the Hungary Initiatives Foundation. And my question relates to the fact that I've heard in conversation many times uh, the accession of Ukraine and Georgia in the same sentence, talked about it at the same time. And yet it seems to me these are two countries who have very different degrees of readiness for accession into NATO. And I wonder whether it would not be uh, more advantageous for Georgia and Ukraine to, separate, to be decoupled in these conversations. Thank you. Are there any more questions? No, there isn't. So, ah, okay, one more. Please keep it short. Uh, I would be very interested in asking more about the public diplomacy that you're doing for NATO. What specifically is being done in countries, so for example, in Turkey, in Germany, in France, where to, to sort of get the people supporting NATO, because you can hardly vote for a budget when people don't understand the value of NATO, what its purpose is, and I'd be interested in the specific strategies that you have in engaging young people, people, media, in uh, talking about NATO. Thank you, and two final questions. One was there. Uh, Thank you, Eto um, Buzeshvili. So you all mentioned the unity, the issue of unity among uh, allies. My question is very short and maybe simple. What do you think will be the response from NATO if uh, Russia moves the border post inside Estonia? Thank you. Um, thanks. My question goes to General Hodges. Um, so my question goes to General Hodges. Uh, my question is about Plexi security as a result, as part of the Warsaw, uh, Warsaw uh, Summit of NATO. Uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, big statements, uh, part of them delivered, but uh, um, being an ex-senior uh, official in the military field of the United States, what would you uh, suggest to the U.S. policymakers and your colleagues in the U.S. military how to operate in the Black Sea and what to do um, after the Warsaw Summit in the Black Sea to cope with the Black Sea security situation uh, given A2 pretty complex A to AD uh, uh, systems installed by the Russians. Thank you. Thank you. Back to the panel, and please be very brief. Max, two minutes. For person, I will start here with General Hodges. So I absolutely agree that Ukraine and Georgia in the session should be decoupled. I mean, there's no reason to link them to each other because they, uh, April, I agree with your, your premise. Um, if Russia moved border posts inside Estonia. Uh, you know, the alliance has a very good process where uh, 29 nations um, would meet, and there's a process to determine, you know, what does this mean? Uh, and, and I think the alliance has demonstrated that it actually can move very quickly uh, to do that. But, you know, we have aircraft violate airspace of allied countries. I mean, these kind of things uh, do happen, and so the alliance, I think, will be smart in how we but I can assure you, uh, if there are American soldiers that are there, you know, they will always defend themselves, and American soldiers will always move to the closest allied commander and stand next to him or her and be ready to fight. That's what will happen. And then the last thing, uh, Black Sea Summit, um, I'm sorry, Black Sea Security, 
uh, what the U.S. is already doing, of course, uh, at, in Romania. We have a missile defense system there, Aegis Ashore uh, being established. Uh, the uh, Romanian air base that we call MK, um, because most Americans cannot properly pronounce Mikhail Kogal Nachanu. Um, we call it MK. Uh, we have almost 1,000 American soldiers there on any given day, plus NATO flies out of there. Uh, we have Americans that have um, joined the various NATO headquarters. They're being established a multinational division there in Romania, for example. Uh, I would like to see this extended, intelligence sharing, maritime exercises. We do sea breeze with Ukrainians right now. I think there's a lot of room for more exercises together. I will maybe come back to this consensus issue. Uh, you know, what I learned from my uh, books uh, about the West, that in the West, when you try to build democracy or try to breach consensus, you always listen to the weakest, to minority. And uh, what our history is showing, that in Bucharest NATO summit, consensus was breached. But I would call it Russia-led consensus. The big states, in, instead of listening to weak and small states who had 100,000 of experience dealing with Russia, they sided with Russia. The result is the occupation of other two, you can call them weak states. But when I, I was, when Lithuanian president and I was standing in front of all, and we've been saying, this is a Munich of 21st century, my dear Europeans. And next will be Crimea and Ukraine. We said it six years before. Nobody was listening to us. So you better listen to the weak and forge the consensus on, on the basis of those weak states. And this is the strength of the Western democracy. Thank you. A uh, couple of words on uh, decoupling the membership process of Ukraine and Georgia. Well, it is in fact, uh, without any linkage uh, between the two, because every country's uh, aspiration uh, to join uh, the alliance is taken care on its own merits. Uh, this is first thing. Second, uh, the last uh, summit meeting in Brussels also uh, proved that uh, NATO's door is open. The open door policy is functioning. Uh, the invitation uh, extended to Skopje to uh, initiate uh, accession talks is a clear sign that uh, we are ready to move ahead in our enlargement process and open door policy will remain uh, one of the fundamental uh, guiding principles of the alliance. Now, regarding the question on public diplomacy, uh, uh, since uh, 2016, uh, we have adopted a more proactive uh, campaign uh, uh, approach uh, led by uh, UK's OASIS model, uh, determining uh, uh, strategies based on uh, audience insights, implementing it, and also uh, assessing the results to inform our decisions on how to calibrate our communications. You refer to key allied nations where communications efforts could be uh, enhanced, and this is where we are looking at. Uh, but the most important thing is uh, NATO uh, itself cannot do it uh, uh, alone. We also require national authorities to roll out their communication uh, activities in an efficient way, and we are working on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I'm going to bring this session to close uh, right away. But just I was thinking how to summarize this debate, and uh, I had only one idea. I think we all have the possibility to make a change, but the time given to us to make this change may be very limited. So I suggest that we all start doing the right thing today. And thank, 
I want to thank and applaud the panelists. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. We're not taking a break now. Um, I'd like to ask uh, General Hodges if you would stay with me on the stage here for a minute, Ben. Uh, over here, and I want to bring up Jim Hake. We have a special unscheduled announcement to make. I have a special unscheduled announcement to make, which is a don't. Please, uh, if we could have quiet in the room, please. Please keep. Keep focus, and I'm going to turn this over to Jim Hake from the Spirit of America Foundation to make a special announcement. Thank you. I'm Jim Hake. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Spirit of America. We are a privately funded non-governmental organization, and uh, we're here to really thank the people of Georgia for their steadfast partnership and friendship in the years since the attacks of 9-11. These uh, friendships and partnerships are critically important to our collective security and prosperity. Is it because of that, uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis has made strengthening America's partnerships a top priority of the national defense strategy. So our friendships are more than just a, a, a nice to have. And we're very proud to help acknowledge our special partnership with the people of Georgia, uh, especially uh, today on September 11th. So we are very happy to announce a donation of $25,000 for the benefit of the people of Georgia. We will be applying these funds working with uh, the U.S. Embassy, U.S. military personnel here in Georgia. And um, this is a gift from ordinary Americans. It's not a U.S. government funding. These are citizens across the United States who want to thank you, thank the courageous people of Georgia, and provide some help for your uh, continued efforts for freedom and independence. Uh, General Hodges is a member of our advisory board, and especially uh, after his uh, awesome performance on the last panel, I'm happy to turn the mic over to him just for a closing word. Thank you. So uh, Jim Hake, Nick Israel, and all the people behind them, this represents what America thinks about our allies and our partners. Uh, I saw this organization firsthand over the last couple of years when I was still the commander of U.S. Army Europe, where they were able to provide money to help efforts to fill gaps that the government can't get to. And so I, just a few weeks ago, I read an article uh, where Nick Israel was up with Georgian border guards helping provide medical equipment to them so that they could continue to do their border mission. It's an example of America's commitment, and I'm very happy, obviously, to see. Uh, uh, when I saw this big check, I thought it was like I had won the sweepstakes or some kind of competition, but then I realized it was not made out to uh, Ben Hodges. It was made out to, uh, to the Republic of Georgia. So, Jim, well done, you and uh, Nick, and I'm, this is a, a great manifestation, another manifestation of America's commitment. We're 300 million people. We're not one person. We're 300 million people best diplomatic corps in the world, as well as great soldiers that care about this country. Thank you.